This is the day that the Lord has blessed, and my prayer is that you rejoice in it. My name is Miguel Mendez, and I am your host. This is your time, a time to rediscover, a time to delve into Scripture, and to find some nuances that God wants to share and bless you with today. Now, before we're blessed, I think it's important to invite the presence of the Spirit as we study. Can you pray with me? God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for opening the new paths. Thank you for being uh, the God that drives us out of the crooked path and onto the straight way. We thank you, Lord, because you trailblaze. You go before us, and we pray now, Lord, that you open our hearts and our minds, that you open a direct path between us so that we can learn something that is applicable to our lives in this time and in this place. For we pray in your name. Amen. Now, a couple of years ago, I was on a date with my wife. And as we had decided, we were going to cook a meal at home and we were going to snuggle together on the couch to watch a movie. So the preparations had been made. The cooking wasn't great, but it was adequate. After all, I was doing it. And she picked the movie out. We had dinner, a wonderful conversation, and now it was time to proceed to the love seat, to sit together in this special place and begin to nestle and nuzzle next to each other so that we could enjoy the film. Now, my wife was attempting to give me a movie that she thought I would be interested in watching. And as we began to see the plot unfold, we realized that neither of us cared too much for the particular film. Except for one thing. When my wife looked at the main protagonist and said, that is a really good looking guy. And when I heard that, I immediately saw the man that I thought or I felt she was comparing me to. And it broke my heart to recognize that this man and I had absolutely nothing in common. And we do that, don't we? When you hear a comment or when you hear a statement being made, you create this own narrative in your head. You jump to these conclusions. And typically the conclusions that you jump to are maybe not the most healthy. You see, the only thing that Linda, my wife, had said was, that is a really good-looking guy. In my mind, the narrative that I had constructed led me to hear, that man is better than you. How often we create these narratives that jump to the worst-case scenario. We, as therapists say, catastrophize the situation because we want to protect ourselves. And narratives protect you. Think about writing a long and detailed text message on your phone. You have opened up your heart and soul, spilled your guts onto that message. You've edited and re-edited. You're nervous. But finally, you decide to put yourself out there and you click send. And you know what follows. Anxious expectation as you see those three little dots appear on your screen. Those three little dots that signify that somebody is thinking about writing a response. And as that moment that seems to be an eternity rushes through your mind as you are experiencing it, you've created a narrative. What if he doesn't respond in a way that shows me that he cares or understands? What if she is uninterested in remaining in a relationship? What if that raise that I think I deserve is instead met with a pink slip? What if he forgot my anniversary? What if she forgot my birthday? We create these narratives in our mind and we believe that these narratives in the end protect us. 
But sadly, what these narratives do isn't protect you, but rather they preclude you from experiencing the type of life that God wants you to experience. You know, God is on the sidelines, ready and waiting to erupt into your narrative and give you a life that you could never dream of. But you have to be open to it. You have to be open to it in the way that our protagonist today was open to it. If you have a Bible, come with me to the book of Acts, the third chapter. Now, some wonderful things are happening. The people have begun to experience this reality that Jesus is risen. And when you follow a a risen Jesus, new and miraculous things occur. You know, the Spirit has baptized the community. It has enveloped and engulfed them. And so now they begin to experience life anew, a life led by the Spirit. In the book of Acts, Luke decides to begin with a birth story, much like he does in his gospel. Only this time, it isn't the birth of the Messiah, but rather... It is the genesis of the Messiah's bride, the church that we are witnessing. And it is an act every bit as miraculous and every bit as providential as what befalls Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem all those years ago. These disciples, quivering and shaking, unsure men, that create narratives that lead them to be insecure and sometimes violent, these disciples have been transformed. They are now inhabiting a new narrative. And I want to read to you 10 verses, 10 verses that express this willingness to live in a new narrative. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave his attention expecting to get something from them. Well, here's the story. Peter and John have just been baptized by the Holy Spirit, and they've descended to the temple court. It is a time of prayer. And so the two disciples probably got lost in a sea of people, a sea of people that had gone to offer their praises and their prayers to God. And what I find really puzzling is that no one is stopping to consider the beggar prostrated at the gate called beautiful. He's outside the temple gate, separated from the community. And his narrative has been one of shame. His narrative has been one of expectation. His narrative has been one where he has been exiled and excluded for a community for sins, either his own or his father's. And yet he waits, diligently expecting something to change. In to the scene, you see these two apostles, and they stop and they see the man. Notice that the man sees them and begs for money in very much the same way as our illustration to begin our conversation today. He sends out a text, a question. He puts himself out there. And Peter and John simply say, look at us. Look at us. And the man glances at the two disciples, looks at them from head to toe, and the Bible says that he is expecting to get something. Ultimately, we all want to be seen. But in order to be seen, we need to have the capacity to see others. 
And what I love about this story is that both John and Peter recognize that poverty and pain must be seen before praise is uttered and prayers are elevated. Before we engage in the act of communal worship, we need to engage in the reality that there are individuals in our community that are experiencing poverty and pain. That is at the heart of worship. The recognition that in our community there are people who are hurting and John and Peter are in tune with that. Why are they in tune with that? Because they have created a narrative that is in tune with the Spirit's narrative. Yet the beggar, the beggar hasn't gotten there yet. You know, his context and his paradigm doesn't allow for the possibility that God is intending and waiting to do something more. You know, too often we believe in this reality that we are created simply to survive. And God is saying, don't you recognize that I've placed you in this world to thrive? But in order to do that, you must see and be seen. So the first thing I want you to remember today is this. Next Sabbath, when you go to your church, remember that before prayers are elevated and praises are uttered, pain and poverty must be seen. Allow the Spirit to make you attuned to the needs of people around you, and then please have courage to enter their narratives. So the man is waiting breathlessly, excited, expectant. Is this the day? Is this the day where I receive some money? Maybe I don't have to come and beg at the temple court tomorrow. Maybe I'll survive. Well, God isn't in the business, as we've said, about surviving. God wants you to thrive. And so Peter says, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. Now, Peter isn't interested in material wealth. Peter Peter is interested in healing the spirit. Programs and plans and buildings are beautiful and important, but not if they are not leveraged to heal the spirit. And how is the spirit healed? In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. Your money couldn't solve the beggar's ultimate problem. Money allowed him only to survive and subsist, but God wanted him to thrive. And so we need today to make a conscious decision to switch out our narratives. To recognize that God is willing to give you more than what you dreamt possible, but only if you realize that it's time to stop surviving and it's time to move into the season of thriving. Bas Kazar, a writer, philosopher, ethicist, talks about the illusion of transparency. Kesar defines this as the inability we have to understand instructions that, and how these instructions will be perceived by people who we are sharing them with. When's the last time that somebody gave you instructions that they considered super simple to follow? But they, it, they were follow, simple to follow because the person giving the instructions failed to realize how those instructions were being perceived by the people receiving them. Empathy is at the heart of Christianity. That is at the soul of our narrative. But in order to truly thrive, we need to stop focusing on how we view faith, how we experience religion, how we manage spirituality, and we need to begin to develop a sense of empathy. You see, Peter knew what the man wanted even even before the man allowed himself to dream it possible. And that's what God wants to do for you. God knows what you want. Those desires that you have that you don't even dream are possible. 
And the prayer that God wants you to write to it, elevate today is this God grant me the ability to speak out those things that I consider impossible and then grant me the wisdom and discernment to go and inhabit other people's narrative and give them what they truly need so I find it funny that as Peter says, what I give you, what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. He doesn't bother with a Bible study. He doesn't engage in this elegant and eloquent expose on faith. No deep and thoughtful conversation of Christology. Now, nah. you know what Peter says? Peter says to the man, walk, walk, because I know what you truly need. Walk. You know, too often we get stuck, uh, stuck giving complex answers to easy questions. Because what is at the heart of what you and I want is the assurance to know that our lives have meaning, that we are not alone, that in spite of everything that swirls around us, there is a future and we have a blessed assurance. We want to walk. Thriving is, uh, is about our capacity to walk in faith. Jesus is telling him, walk. but we can only invite people on this walk if we see pain and poverty, if we see privation. How else are our prayers going to affect and effect these situations if we don't see them first? But Peter doesn't just say something. Peter then reaches down and takes the man's hand. A preaching about Jesus without a perceivable, perceivable physical action is useless. Peter recognizes this. And so not only does he see pain, not only does he speak to pain, but he engages pain by bowing down and lifting up. Thriving rests on our capacity for empathy. But in order to empathize, in order to resist the illusion of transparency, we need to bend over and help. You know, Peter reaches down and says, I want to help you. He helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. He was lifted up, and the beggar ceases to be a beggar and becomes a fellow worshiper. That's what I find so beautiful about this story. We see two men who have been baptized by the Spirit, who are seen and who see who are recognized as disciples and who disciple in turn. These men recognizing that pain and privation and poverty need to be seen before prayers are effected and praises are, are, are uttered. Why? Because the prayers and the praises need to be relevant to the situation of those who are suffering. 
They are seen and they see. And then they inhabit the narrative of a man. A man who has made it his life's mission to survive. Not even giving himself the capacity to dream about the fact that God has it in his mind to allow you to thrive. But Peter cuts through this narrative of mere survival and touches the cord on what the man truly wants, on what he truly needs. And it's not complicated. In this time, in this time of division and rancor and angst and insecurity and infighting, in this time, what the world really needs is Jesus. And the world is looking breathlessly to the church, hoping and expecting that the church can say something. That the church can see and be seen. And then Peter says, let me respond to your question with a new narrative. Walk. What would happen, I wonder, if today you chose to respond to the narratives that swirl around you, not by engaging, but by presenting an alternative? What if the solutions to the ills of America weren't about a political system, but rather centered around the notion of mutual respect and service? What if the issues of your family could be solved when your default position wasn't rancor, but grace? What if your marriage could be rebuilt when you realized that empathy means giving your spouse not what you think he or she needs, but the deepest desires of her heart? What would happen if we forgo the temptation to inhabit these narratives that we have constructed in order to participate in the story that he has crafted. Peter says, get up and walk. So he speaks Jesus. He sees poverty. He, speaks, he sees pain. He speaks into it. He speaks Jesus. But that's not enough. Praying and praising isn't enough. You know, sometimes the invitation for us, for those of us who follow the Lamb, is to get our hands dirty. Now, to bend down into the ground and to reach up and lift people. Public policies and programs don't lift people out of poverty. Empathy. And seeing each other as connected, as brethren. That's what lifts us up. So Peter says, let me lift you up. Let me bend over, bend down and inhabit the same space you inhabit in order to lift you up. Because I can give you instructions. I can give you a five-point plan on how you ought to live your life. But if we learn, if Boss Kazar has taught us anything through the illusion of transparency, is that those instructions and those plans might be misunderstood. So instead of giving you advice, let me actually help you. Peter bends down, reaches into the ground, and lifts the man up. And that transforms the man. It completely changes the narrative. He doesn't go back to the gate beautiful to beg. He goes into the worship, into the temple to pray. He hops and skips and praises. 
And the best way in which the world out there can be won over for the Christ that you and I follow, the best way in which we can fill the world with awe and amazement is by showing the world how much we care. By seeing pain, by allowing our prayers and praises to speak to that pain, by speaking out to a society that believes that there are only a couple narratives that we can use as solutions. And, and so we speak out and we say, Jesus. And then by reaching down and actually becoming invested. That transforms beggars into worshipers. It changes uncertain and unsecure and insecure fishermen into disciples. And it can also shift and switch you and me. So go out and love radically. Go out and serve well. Go out and create new narratives. Go out and get invested. For that, that is your clarion call. Let us pray. Jesus, we have come to a moment in history where the penchant to believe in narratives has forced us to create, to believe that you have called us merely to survive. Today we want to be baptized with your spirit the spirit that will cause us to thrive. We pray, Lord, then, that we might have the care and compassion to hear and see poverty and pain. We pray that our worship and our prayers speak to that reality. We pray, then, Lord, that we engage the world in presenting a narrative that is birthed and filled with Jesus. And then, oh Lord, then might we empathize with others. Might we reach down and pull them up. This is how the world is transformed. Father, may through the, our lives, through our examples, through our stories, may people feel the same awe and amazement. In your name we pray. Amen.